teach us to what ministry or ministries you have called us as your son called individual followers with unique gifts. We know you have called us as well. Show us our gifts as we pray the words your son told us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
teacher and a coach at James River High School, and a few days ago she succumbed to cancer. Um, her husband and two young children are left behind, so I ask that you please pray for her family. Um, Carrie and Holly grew up playing ball together, so this will hit a little closer to her. I'd like to ask for prayers for my grandmother. She's been in the hospital. Um, she's out of the hospital now, but in a nursing home temporarily. Um, she had, I'm not even sure what the original reason was, but then she also had a, a, a mini stroke and has been having a couple mini strokes. So just prayers for my grandmother. Her name's Gwen Hennon. Good morning again. I have an update. I asked for prayers last week for our neighbor. Her name was Julie Bryant, and I talked to her this week, and she's doing much better. And it was um, related to the Lyme disease. It's just been eating her up inside. But she said it was kind of a stroke, seizure type thing. So she's doing a lot better and uh, feeling up to moving around some. So she got out this week. So she was really glad to see that. <laughs> Any of you who does not 
give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. I'm not quite as efficient as Ben as I need my notes, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> Start off with a quick story. <clears throat> a man gets onto a charter plane and goes and takes a seat. The plane takes off. Short while into the, into the flight, the flight attendant comes down, to the, comes down the aisle, approaches the man, offers him a parachute, and says, here's a little bit of uh, insurance, just in case. You might want to put this on. So the man thinks, well, okay, insurance, what can it hurt? So he puts the parachute on. As the flight goes on, he gets a little uncomfortable. The parachute's heavy, it's bulky. He can't really move around much. He can't reach for things. And on top of all that, some of the other people on the flight are starting to look at him kind of funny. Maybe mock him a little bit. As this continues to go on and on, the man decides, this just isn't worth it. He takes the parachute off. He sets it in the aisle of the airplane. The flight attendant sees this, comes down, picks up the parachute, takes it down to another person on the flight. But this time, the flight attendant says to the person, this plane's going to break apart in five minutes. So you might want to put this parachute on. So the person puts the parachute on. A little while later in the flight, the plane goes down. Let me ask you, do you know what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month? How about next year? You may have plans, you may think you know, but the truth is none of us really knows what lies ahead for our lives. As Christians, we have faith in what comes after death, and we know that death will eventually come. We take comfort in the promise of eternal life with Christ by our side. We know the end game. But... While I dare say most of us have already accepted Christ, how are we living our lives day to day? Being a Christian isn't easy. We're told in Acts 14, 22, only through many trials and tribulations can we enter the kingdom of God. Sometimes being a Christian can make us uncomfortable. We feel restricted, limited. We're oftentimes mocked by other people. Too often we turn away. We lay our parachutes in the aisle. To truly accept Christ means that we invite Him into all aspects of our lives. We share our joy with Him and our accomplishments. We seek His comfort in times of trouble. We allow Him to speak through us. We show the world His grace in all that we do. It's not an easy task, to be sure. But accepting Christ into all that we do, at all times, means that we're always prepared. We're always ready for what life, or death, may throw at us. And let's not forget, despite all of our own iniquities, all of our sin, all the times that we turn away, Christ continues to accept us, to love us. When the time comes, when your flight encounters trouble, and your plane may be going down, where will, you, where will your parachute be? Will it be in the aisle because things just got too hard? I suggest that, no, give everything over to Christ. Strap the parachute on and be able to stand before God and say that you finished what you started. Amen. Thank you. 
other on earth, but here we can know and understand each other's because of work of the mercenaries. As each of us gives, we do not know how it will affect the world around us, but we can know that it will. Let's receive our offer.
second floor of Owens Hall, 1212 Hull Street. Y'all see that picture? That's that building on the top. Not very fancy, is it? Kind of looks old and, and run down, but that was the first Sunday school. And the Sunday school started before the church, believe it or not. So they organized the Sunday school. Frequently on Thursday nights, J.C. Tyler, pastor of 7th Street, would walk from his home in Richmond over to Manchester and preach. Z. Parker Richardson held a revival of the mission, which resulted in a godly number of additions, among whom was George B. Eli, who later became prominent in the church. About 1881, the mission was temporarily suspended but soon revived. The Bible school grew to such an extent that on April the 15th, 1889, for the sum of $1,000, the Young Men's Missionary Society was deeded the life on which the present church now stands. The following year, a church building, similar to the present one, exclusive of a slide edition, was erected and formally dedicated November the 16th with an overflowing audience. So they built a church and it was dedicated whole bunch of people. And J.C. Tyler, Cincinnati, who played such a prominent part in the early mission, was presented and preached the service. Okay, now listen to this. They built a new church. Eighteen days later, Thursday night, December the 4th, I.J. Spencer was called to become the first pastor. That was the first pastor we ever had in this church. His name was I.J. Spencer. That was 1890. He became the first pastor. And the following Thursday, December the 11th, 1890, the church was organized with 31 members, 26 from 7th Street. And about 11 o'clock the same night, a fire of undetermined origin completely destroyed the roof and interior of the structure. Leaving only the four brick walls standing, the loss being estimated at four thousand dollars with no insurance. So, what do you guys think they did? The people here they, they formed the Sunday school and they formed the new church and they built it and they dedicated it and had their first sermon and it burned down that night. And that was this church. Unbelievable. So what did they do? You think they rebuilt it? Did they go home and stop? No, well, this is what they did. On the succeeding Sunday, December the 14th, the small band, crippled but not discouraged, met at 9.30 a.m. in Gibbs Hall, 15th and Holstrom's, and they organized the Sunday school with 44 scholars and five teachers. The pastor made special mention of the calamity of the preceding Thursday night and an offering of $150 in cash and pledges was secured to help rebuild the church. So they all got together and came to Sunday school even with no church. So what would we do? What would we do if we came in here on Sunday morning and the church was all burnt down? Would we go home? I don't know. I think we would have a church. I think the pastor would then would get under a tree in the parking lot and would, he would probably do a service. And we'd all come together and bring the church back. That would used to be. So it's very important for the laity of the church and everything that we do. <coughs> we do an awful lot. So this is a very good book, it's in the library, and it's just really fascinating to read it. So I have a prayer. Who wants to say a prayer? It's late, it's Sunday. You guys are late. So what is the church besides a building? What is it? I don't know. Is it the people? Because their building can burn down. But the church will still be here. So it can't be the building, right? And all the people in this story, they're all gone, right? They're, they're, they, they lived 100 years ago. So it wasn't what those, those people were a part of the church, but they passed it on to us. So we're the church, the people, the laity. We're the church. You guys are
I praise your greatness, my God and King. I will praise you forever and ever. I will praise you every day. I will praise you forever and ever. The Lord is great, worthy of our praise. No one can understand how great he is. In Jesus' name we pray for you.
I do believe that. I just have to remind myself that sometimes we have to wander through the house to find the open window. <laughs> it's not always an easy proposition, this trusting in God's plan for us. But maybe if we remember that God's plan for each of us ends with eternal life at His side, we'll be more inclined to look toward the big goal and not worry so much about the little things. In closing, I offer up to you this piece of scripture from Romans 13, 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As we continue to pray, O oh God of life, affirming that you sent Jesus to draw us towards life abundant, as we prepare to drink this cup, we remember how your love was revealed in Jesus Christ's witness and words, suffering and sacrifice. In the living Christ who dwells among us and within, our cup overflows with goodness and mercy as we share this cup of life. Let your glory be revealed as we pray meditate. In Jesus' name, amen.
cup of salvation. We now come to our moment of passing of the peace. I would invite each of you to stand and greet those around you and offer God's blessing. I would also remind you, though, that it is the cold and flu season. So if you are a little under the weather and perhaps don't want to shake somebody's hand, please don't feel obligated. And if you're not offered a hand, please don't be offended. There's plenty of God's love around us.
Our next scripture reading comes from the books of, book of Romans again, chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. You can find this starting on page 1763 of your pew Bibles. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Talents and gifts. We've talked a lot about them. Reese did so when he was pastor here. Ross has spoken about them many times. I've mentioned them in previous messages. Ben, too. As a congregation, we have a wealth of blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Music. Leon, I love the way you did Amazing Grace today. Teaching. Helping our young folks, Jimmy. Ministering. Administrative. Creative. You name it. There's so much more. All these things are great, to be sure. But Christian sharing can be very simple. A smile or a good morning as we pass a complete stranger on the street. A random act of kindness to someone who's down. Lending an ear to a friend who's struggling with a problem. Congratulating a child when they learn something new. Shining the light of Christ where there once was darkness can be free and can take as little as a moment. But the effects can change someone's life. Also, sharing yourself as a child of God doesn't have to be something that's planned. Sometimes God reveals himself spontaneously, without us even knowing it, and gives us an opportunity to share his grace. I see this regularly in the prisons, where myself and the other saints are often approached by an individual inmate who just wants to talk. On a more personal level, I've mentioned before how my brother's divorce a few years ago brought the two of us closer together. I was happy to be his confidant, someone that he could come to and just vent. It was some time later that he revealed what I believed to be a little bit different way that God worked through me. My brother told me that there were times that he could be in the depths of despair, and I would say something, just the right words, that would lift him completely out of those doldrums. And it didn't even appear that I realized I had done it. Probably because I didn't. I admitted that to him that I probably didn't know, but rather think that those were the times that I was merely a vessel, that that was God speaking through me. As brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing our faith in word and deed is perhaps the most powerful tool that we have. So I would encourage you to embrace the opportunities that you're given. Don't let them pass you by. Trust that God will work through you. It's what we're directed to do. It's what God calls us on, on us to do as a community of followers. We're told in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16, a very familiar verse, we, may, we all probably know it as the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. My brother once told me that he knew at some point that he needed to make things right with the big guy upstairs but that he felt probably God didn't want to hear from him just yet. I frequently hear similar sentiments from the men that I interact with in the prisons, but I told my brother, as I tell the inmates, and as I tell anyone else feeling similarly distant from God, that God is always ready to listen. He wants us to accept Him, He wants us to trust Him, 
and he wants us to share his grace with others. Accept, trust, share. Three to live by. If you want to begin that journey, we invite you to come forward and accept Christ publicly by confession of faith. Or perhaps you want to reaffirm your trust in his plan for you. Similarly, you can come forward and do so. Or if you've been searching for a church home and wish to share with this congregation through a transfer of membership, please join us up front as we sing our invitation hymn, number 477, Pass It On. <laughs> 